Welcome to another session here at Sunnah Followers. And this is the 15th day of the sixth or the 16th day of Ramadan, the 16th day of fasting. And we are almost at the end of Ramadan. And we've discussed how Ramadan is the month of change and how we as Muslims should have made the most of our fasting time by changing the condition of ourselves. We have had a few weeks now to take a deep, good, hard look at ourselves and detail uh, what our strengths are as Muslims and what our weaknesses are as Muslims. And everybody's strengths and weaknesses will be different. I want you guys to understand that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stressed to his companions, the same way I stress to you guys that we are not all the same. Each and every one of us are, are, are on different levels of closeness with the law. Each and every one of us are on different levels of closeness, even with each other. And each and every one of us have our own personal walks in life to encounter. Your walk in life is not going to be the same as mine. Your tests, your trials in life are not going to be the same as mine. And the stronger we are, are in our faith, the closer we are to Allah, the greater your trial, the greater your test will be. <clears throat> and also recognizing that we're not the same means that I may can handle some things that you can't. You may can handle some things that I can't handle. Okay. But what we have to understand is that that is the way Allah made us. We're all different. We all have the same purpose, which is uh, to show Allah how much we truly do believe in him and to worship him alone. We may have the same purpose in life. And we may even have the same goal. Our ultimate goal should be paradise. But the way to obtain that goal, the way to reach that goal is not going to be the same, you know, for each and every one of us. We all have a different, you know, path, you know, uh, to follow in order to reach that goal. And that path is going to be uh, 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 filled with many different trials based on where we are in our belief and understanding of Islam. Okay. We talked about how Allah has imposed fasting upon us, not as a punishment. Fasting has been imposed upon us as a means of helping us in our plight, helping us in our plight to obtain paradise, okay? He imposed it upon us because we are giving away, we're pulling ourselves away from the things we enjoy the most in life, our food, our drink, you know, our social activities. You know, we're pulling ourselves away from these things to spend more time concentrating and remembering a law. By doing that, not only will it help make you aware as to what your weaknesses are, what your uh, strengths are and all of that, but also it makes you aware of how lacking you may be in your relationship with the law. And uh, many of us are very, very lacking when it comes to our relationship with a law. We all say, I believe in Allah. We all say, la ilaha illallah. But how many of us truly understand the implications of saying that? If you believe in Allah, that means you put him first and foremost in your life. That means you put him above your desires. That means you put him above your family. And when you put him above, that means you honor his laws, his rules, even if they make you angry, okay? That means you train yourself to love only what he loves, to hate only what he hates, and keep the personal stuff, your personal likes, your personal dislikes, toss them to the side. 
If your personal likes, your personal dislikes contradict what he likes and dislikes, you toss it away. That's having allegiance to Allah. And if we can't do that, if we can't put aside our personal likes and our personal dislikes, if they uh, infringe upon what Allah likes and what he dislikes, and that means you don't have allegiance to him. And that's what it's all about, you know, having allegiance to Allah, first and foremost, first and foremost. And then after having allegiance to Allah, allegiance to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does that mean? That doesn't mean I'm Arabic, so because I'm Arabic, I got an allegiance to the Prophet. Nope. That doesn't mean because I speak Arabic that I got allegiance to the Prophet. No. That doesn't mean that because I can recite the Quran beautifully that I have allegiance to Allah. I mean, to the prophet. To have allegiance to the prophet means that I try to take his teachings and make his teachings the example in my life. That I try to worship my Lord the way that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam worshiped him that I put emphasis in my life on the things that the Prophet Muhammad emphasized, okay? That's having allegiance to him. And then we're supposed to have allegiance to the believers, no matter who they are or where they are. That means I don't care where you come from, how you look, you can have a kickstand for a leg one eye and one snaggle tooth hanging out your mouth. But the simple fact that you say you believe la ilaha illallah Muhammad or Rasulullah just like me, the fact that you perform your prayers just like me, the fact that you dress in a hijab just like me, that's what unites me to you, not how you look not your snaggle tooth, not your kickstand for a leg, okay? Not the garbled language that you speak. It's your belief system. Your belief system and practice, that's what unites us together. Muslims all over the world, we are all doing the same thing right now, fasting. All of us are going without food from dawn till sunset. If we truly were practicing the deen, we would be able to show the entire world just how great a force we are, just how strong a body we are. But unfortunately, even though there are Muslims all over the world going without food and drink, how many of them are fulfilling the other obligations? How many of them are showing their allegiance to Allah? How many of them are showing their allegiance to the prophet? How many of them are showing their allegiance to the believers? And remind you, I'm saying believers, not Muslims. There's a difference. Anybody can be a Muslim. All you have to do is say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah. Now you are Muslim. But not everyone can be a believer. A believer is not just a person that says that he submits to a law. The believer is one who takes what he says and puts it in action. It shows in how he behaves himself, how he conducts himself. It shows in how he handles his trials of life. It shows in how he handles himself when he's happy how he handles himself when he's sad. And everything that that person does in their life always centers around his belief in Allah and his allegiance to that prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the difference. A lot of us are Muslim, but not many of us are believers. If your allegiance is to something other than Allah and the prophet and the believers, you're not one of us. That's what the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And I know it's so easy. We had a good um, uh, session today 
on the signs of the last hour. And Sister Zainab, who's from the United Kingdom, uh, she's been uh, joining my website off and on over the years. She's not new. A lot of people think she's a new sister here to my website. No, no. She's been coming here for years off and on, off and on, off and on, off and on. She grew up on this website. I remember her from back in the day, back in the day. But she's grown up into a beautiful, intelligent woman. And she shared with us her job, her experiences. She travels to the Muslim lands that are going, that are where Allah has sent many trials and calamities to. She witnesses what's really going on there. And she shared with us what she sees. It's not this unity that those of us who live in the West are led to believe. Like she said, the Muslims in those lands in Syria and Palestine and those other lands that are torn apart, the Muslims are torn apart too. She said they're all torn apart too. You don't see the allegiance to Allah. You don't see the allegiance to the prophet in those lands. And she works there. She goes and travels to those lands. That's her job. And she was saying, it's a wake up call for those of us who do live in the West, who are deluded. Our allegiance needs to be put where it needs to be on a law and the prophet coming back to Islam in its truthfulness until we come back to Islam in its truthfulness is going, we're going to continue to divide. We're going to continue to be um, uh, punished by a law because that's what that is. What's going on in Syria and what's going on in all these other Muslim countries. This is punishment. This is punishment from a law. Anybody that tells you it's not is deluded, as she says. She goes there. She stays there. She sees the division. She sees the hatred amongst the Muslims, the separatism. She sees the misplaced allegiance. She sees the misplaced guidance. Everybody has their own agenda. People are walking to the beat of their own drum. They're not walking to the drum of the law and the prophet. That's the reality. We have to come together first with ourselves. That's why I did the whole session last week on trying to better yourself. Instead of worrying about other, what other people do to you, look at how we oppress ourselves. Look at what you're doing to yourself. Because as this sister says, she lives it, she witnesses, this is her job to go in those countries as a Muslim and they are torn apart. There is no unity. There is no Islam in its truthfulness. It's my own agenda. Just like the prophet said it would be. Just like the prophet said it's going to happen, which is happening. So my job as a diet, <clears throat> I don't care what any other diet do. I may not speak the way the others do. I could care less. I'm going to be honest. I don't want to speak like them because to me, they sugarcoat. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the people that will be closest to me on the day of judgment are those who are down to earth. Who the people can come to and ask questions to and they get the answers even if the answer is not what they want to hear. Those are the people that will be closest to me. The people that others gravitate towards because they find it easier to get it from them, even if they don't want to accept it. I'm one of those people. So I rather, my dawah has always been grassroot in your face. My dawah is never going to change from that. If you don't like what I say, close your ears. 
If what I say is too deep for you to handle and you take it too personally, then maybe you need to go and associate with those other Daya who will tell you everything that you want to hear and put a kiss on it too. Okay? But I'm telling you, we got to wake up. We got to wake up. We have to change the condition of ourselves. The prophet said charity begins with, at home with you. We how can we unite as a Uma when we're not guided correctly ourselves? How can we be a strong Uma when we are a weak, weak individuals ourselves? How can we be united when we are walking and have our own personal agenda? That's what you see when you go to those countries. That's the reality. And that's the reality that we see here in the West within ourselves. That's why we, we're, we, we take stuff so personal. We can't see, as Sister May Leon said, beyond the trees. We're so simple-minded. We can't read between the lines. We're narrow-minded. Allah says he hates narrow-minded people. We're supposed to be able to see the big picture. Most Muslims, we can't see beyond what's right in front of us. We're narrow-minded. We have to change this about ourselves. Until we do that, we will never excel as an individual, and we definitely won't excel as a nation. Hello. Goodbye. So we're in this third week of fasting. Almost at the end of this third week. Ramadan is really, we'll be looking for the last 10 days in a few minutes. Ramadan is almost over. What changes have you made? What type of growth have you made this month? Do you feel that you have closered yourself to a law? or distance yourself from him? Is your allegiance to Allah, to the prophet Muhammad, and to the believers, or is your allegiance to some other agenda? That's the question I want you guys to work on for the rest of these days that's left of this third week. What is my agenda? Is my agenda to be in allegiance with Allah and the believers, or is my agenda something else? With that said, let me get off into today's lecture. As we work on trying to better our relationship with Allah and then with ourselves, because this is the week of trying to do away with our own personal oppressions against ourselves. One of the greatest oppressions we do against ourselves is our, we misuse, we misuse and abuse our tongue, especially for those of us who are female. This is a big problem, including myself. I'm a female. I'm in the category two. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us one of the number one things that will cause many of us to fall to the side and be in the hellfire is failure to control our tongue. We're so quick to open our mouths and speak when we don't even know if what we're speaking about is true. I saw... Um, a beautiful um, memo on one of my students' uh, personal uh, pages, profile pages today. Very beautiful uh, quote from the Quran. Uh, speak the truth, even if you are the only one that does it. Beautiful, but first of all, you have to know what the truth is. That's the thing. We all think that we're that we are speaking truths, but are we really? That's the question. And this is something that the prophet told us before you open your mouth. 
even when it comes to advising another Muslim. If I want to give Nasiha to Amina Fresno, before I even approach her, I got to make sure that number one, I got a reason to approach her. I got to make sure that really she did something wrong. Not personally wrong. Remember, guys, we're supposed to be training ourselves to love what Allah loves and to hate what Allah hates. What does that mean? That means it ain't personal. I'm not, it ain't got nothing to do with my personal feelings about something. So before I go to speak to Amina Fresno, to give her advice, to enjoying the good, I have to first of all make sure that she did something worthy of me approaching her. Do you guys get it? Yes, enjoying good and forbidding evil is an obligation, but we do more harm than good. And the number one reason is because first of all, do you have reason to approach that person to enjoin or forbid? If it's personal, that means you ain't got no reason. If it's something personal that you don't like, then maybe you need to check yourself. Maybe your likes are not in sync with what Allah likes. Okay? So that's the first thing. I have to just figure out, first of all, do I have reason to approach this person? Secondly, and this is from the prophet Muhammad. This ain't from Layla. Everything I teach you, y'all know, I'll back it up with the clear evidence. This is the, what, how the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to enjoin and forbid. Number one, make sure before you approach a person to say anything to them that they did something wrong. Secondly, Make sure that whatever you say to them is correct. We stand up for the truth and we speak the truth, but most of us don't know what the truth is. We don't know the truth if it hits us in the face. Most of us don't even like to hear the truth. More or less know what it is. That's what leads to wars. Most wars began by people calling themselves speaking what they thought was the truth. Most wars in the Muslim lands began by people thinking them of themselves as enjoining good <clears throat> and forbidding evil when they should have followed the first two steps that the prophet said. Number one, make sure there's reason. There's cause. Make sure that there's cause. Did that person actually violate a law? Not you. That's different. Did that person say something or do something that violates the commands or tenets of a law? And then number two, it, are you going, what you have to say to them, is it correct? And then your delivery. And then your delivery. And then your delivery. And who you are. Remember, we talked about that. If not everybody is going to take uh, nasiha or advice from just anyone. Look at your relationship to that person. Maybe you are somebody that that person ain't going to take from. If you're sinning, if you're living in sin, if you're disobeying a law, why should that person listen to you? I'm giving examples. How can you advise this person when you yourself is doing sin? All of that has to be considered before you approach someone. So yes, we speak up. And we adhere to the truth, even if it means we're the only one. But look at that verse. If we're the only one, if you're the only one, maybe you're the only one because you're wrong. 
if a tragedy occurred, if a person did something that was really against the law, against his prophet, against the religion, then why are you the only one mouthing up about it? Why ain't nobody else holding your flag? Maybe you're the only one because you're the one at fault. You're the one that was misguided. You are the one that took something personal when nobody else did. Maybe you were the one that could not see beyond the surface of things. Maybe you were the one, as Sister May Leon said today, who couldn't read, read the, the fine print. Maybe everyone else got the message, but you didn't because of something that you're going through. So maybe that is why you are the only one standing there looking foolish and nobody else is supporting you. We have to look at the all ends of it. Remember as Muslims, one of the things that I emphasize as a diet to all of you, and you guys that stay in this Zoom room, y'all see me do it with myself. The prophet said, check your intentions and check your actions before you do the deed and after. Before, and after, I always check myself before I come in here and teach to y'all, before I reprimand anyone, I check myself before, I record it. I'm on video and then I play it back every night. I watch myself every night to see, did I transgress Allah's limits? Did I do something wrong? And if I did, I won't hesitate to make it up. just like the case with the cat. When I told the sister that she couldn't buy or a cat, when I talked to Sheikh Morrison, he said that, no, that's talking about a house cat. We can't buy, buy and sell a wild cat. I came right back here publicly and cleaned it up. You know, check yourself before and after guys. If you see that you're the only one standing there by yourself holding a sign saying, speak the truth, even if you're the only one, you need to look and see, am I the fool? Maybe I'm the fool. Maybe I'm the one that's at fault. Maybe I didn't understand what the truth was. Maybe I misconstrued the meaning of something. Maybe I was too narrow-minded and couldn't see beyond something. Or maybe I took something personal that wasn't meant to be taken personal. Maybe I made a mistake. And that's the thing that we are so afraid to say. I messed up. I made a mistake. I misread a situation. I misunderstood a situation, especially being a woman. We women have, this is what, by the, let me explain this too. I'm getting ready to answer your question too, sister. A sister asked this question. What does the prophet mean when he said that we women are not like men? We're on a different level than men. That's the PMS. We women suffer with this thing called PMS. That's why it takes four women to witness something where it only takes two men. It takes eight women when it only takes four because we women, we're, we're emotional, especially those of us who suffer with sickness. A lot of us are on anxiety pills. A lot of us are taking medication for the illnesses that we got. Our minds, I tell you guys all the time, my mind ain't all the way here. You know, I'm on all kinds of medications. So maybe I could have mis misread something, misunderstood something. That's how we women are. We're emotional and our bodies are governed by PMS. So being a woman before we open our mouths, to give nasiha or advice to anybody, we definitely need to check ourselves. We need to do a rewind like I do every night. I come in here and rewind all these lectures. The people that hang out with me in this Zoom at night know I sit up here all night playing all my lectures for the day back. 
so I can hear what I did, hear what mistakes I said. Maybe I got went too far and hurt somebody's feelings. I'll come back and say, you know, I love you. The next day I'll come in here and say, you know, I love you, sister. We women have to rewind because we have this thing called PMS, especially those of us on medication. And I'm on medication so I can speak about it. So again, as Muslims, we do speak the truth, even if we're the only one that does it. But make sure that you ain't the only one because you the fool. Oftentimes, you are the only one that's crying wolf because you're wrong. That happens sometimes. It's happened to me. So this is what I'm gonna speak about today, the importance of us guarding our tongue. Before we go to give any advice to anyone, before we open our mouths to, to make a comment in response to something, there are certain things we should check, especially if we a woman, because we women got that thing called PMS. We ain't all right here. And let me put this up on the screen. And please pay attention because this is what all of us as women need to work on this session of uh, uh, this week, these last few days of uh, fasting. And let me put my little background on. I'm back to using my own background, y'all. And hello, I'm always alone. Me and all I got is a law and then myself. And there is my beautiful moving background. The cave. Reminds you of those three young boys stuck in the cave. Hello. It's more graphic anyway. Anyway, let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen. It's raining outside and it has my knees hurting so bad. Okay, inshallah, everybody should be able to see. We're gonna speak about the importance of guarding the tongue. The importance of guarding the tongue. I want everybody to remember, Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, not a word does a person utter without an angel watching, ready to record it. And also Allah tells us in the interpretation of the meaning, your Lord is forever watchful. We talked about how each and every one of us has an angel assigned over each shoulder. Those angels job are to write down the bad things that we say and the good things we say. Whatever we do is recorded and whether it's good or bad as well. So this is what Allah means when he says he's forever watchful. Nothing escapes him, not a word do you say will escape him. So every individual must understand that we are all held accountable for the choices we make in this life. We are all held accountable for the actions we take on in this life. So we have to protect our tongue from all types of actions, from all types of speech that can end up harming us. And again, as women, most of our punishment is gonna come because of that tongue. One of the things that the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us is, if you don't have something of benefit to say, then just shut up. And this is a big problem with a lot of Muslims. We're so quick to put our opinion in, our view. This was a problem we had yesterday at Sunnah Fathers. You want to share your, your, your view. You got to get your word in. If it's nothing good, if it's nothing of benefit, if it's nothing that's going to uh, make the chaos stop, then just shut up. 
And that's hard for us women to do. It's hard for us women to walk away from that. Oh God. Um, it's hard for us women uh, to walk away from that. Hold on for a second, guys. Okay. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him speak good or remain silent. If you don't have anything good to say about something, then just shut up. I see on Facebook, how some of you sisters, I'll go to your Facebook page. Again, that's my job to do so as a dyer. I'll go to your uh, Facebook pages. Um, somebody hit the mics, please. Uh, moderator, hit the, hit, take the mics off. Yeah, please, it's distracting me. Okay, I can go and look on some of your Facebook pages and I'll see that somebody, I can see that somebody will come to your Facebook page and write something nice to you. Oh, mashallah, sister, what a nice thing that you did at the mosque yesterday. May Allah bless you. And then a couple other people come, yes, may Allah bless you. Then somebody else come and say, well, I didn't like it. The chicken that you cooked was too dry. I just saw that today on a sister's page. I guess she made um, iftar. Some sister made iftar for her community. And a lot of people came on her page and talked about how nice the meal was and thank you. Well, some idiot came behind them and wrote, well, I personally didn't like it. The chicken was too dry. We have to stop having chicken and we need to include other meats like lamb and goat. I mean, you, who needed to hear that? Here, this sister did a good deed. Maybe she can't afford to buy lamb and goat. Lamb and goat is expensive. Maybe all she could afford to buy was chicken. SubhanAllah. You don't have anything nice to say. So you had to come and put that on her Facebook page. Shame on you. And this is what the prophet is saying. We do enough damage with our tongue that's gonna land most of us in the hellfire. If you don't have something good to say, then just shut up. So this is something that we need to work on, especially us women. Listen to what Imam Ashafi said. He said, when a person desires to talk, then it is upon that person to think before he speaks. If there is beneficial good in what he has to say, then speak. But if you doubt that what you say is good, then just remain quiet. In fact, Abu Musa Ashari tells us that he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, oh, Prophet of Allah, which of the Muslims is best? The Prophet said, the one whose tongue and hand the other Muslims are secured from, subhanAllah, Allah, again, think before you speak. We are a simple-minded, emotional nation. We are quick to take things personal. Before you open your mouth to call yourself checking someone, make sure that you got reason to check them because maybe it's something personal for, with you. And that's why you're the only one holding that sign up. If you can't con congratulate or compliment a sister, on taking her time and effort to do something good, then keep your comments to yourself. And that makes the conflict and the chaos disappear. Subhana Allah. Also, there's another hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever can guarantee for me that you can guard what lies between your, your legs and what lies between your jaws, meaning your tongue, then I can guarantee paradise for you. We all claim that we want the same outcome, which is paradise. Well, did you keep your tongue closed? Did you keep your legs closed? Or were you quick to open your legs? 
Were you quick to open your mouth? Think about that, especially us women. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, indeed, a person will say a word not aware of its consequences. And because of that, you can be cast into the hellfire. Subhana Allah. And I say this, a person can say a word or a person can take something so personal and because of that, you create a whole war. You bring a whole war. You turn a website into a fighting ground because of you and your own personal insecurities. You felt the need to open your mouth when you should not have unless it was something that violated the rights of a law or the prophet or the believers then you speak but if it's a personal thing that affected you personally you should have kept it to yourself because what you did was created a battleground it was only two of y'all on that team by the way it was just two on your team But look at the what the havoc it caused over nothing, over nothing, nothing that violated the laws of Allah, nothing that violated the Prophet Muhammad or the believers. It was just a personal thing for you and one other person. And I say both of you need to reaffirm what allegiance, what you are, where your allegiance is to be. Both of you need to review what la ilaha illallah Muhammad do Rasulullah means. Both of you need to review where our allegiance should be. Is it to a religion or is it to a language? Yesterday, is I played a lecture last night after all the conflict that went on in my Zoom room. Because you know me, I'm going to check my actions before and after just to make sure that I ain't the one that had a problem. And I wasn't the one that had a problem because I put on a lecture from a well known scholar who's on Huda TV. He happens to be the Imam of Sister Rashida's mosque. The same lecture. And what did he say? I mean, a phrase, no. What did he say? I mean, the phrase, no, what did he say? The lecture I put on where he talked about culture and Islam. What did he say? Is I mean, the no here? Cause I have always got somebody here to listen to me. Was anybody else here besides I mean, since I mean, probably driving and ain't answering. He said, Islam is our culture. He said, Islam is not based on language. He said, language is culture. And he gave the same example that I give you guys, how you got all these Muslims in France talking about how France is oppressing them. He said, when most of the people that moved to France we're from Algeria and Morocco and Egypt, the North African countries. They stopped speaking Arabic and instead replaced it with French. He said, now, now they want to talk about how their culture is violated. He sat there and said, our culture is not a language. Our culture is to believe in Allah and to believe and follow his messenger and have allegiance to the believers, no matter what language they speak. Is that not what he said? And his name is Kareem Ab Abu Zaid, well-known scholar. And by the way, he's Arabic like me too. And by the way, he's from my country, Egypt. So now is he a racist? 
Is he a racist for making that statement? Are you gonna deny that he's an Arab like you deny me being one? You don't accept me as an Arabic. So are you gonna disown him as an Arabic too? Because he said the same exact words I said in his recording. You can Google it. You Muslims need to get back to the basics and learn your deen. Stop pledging allegiance to flags. Stop pledging allegiance to language. Stop pledging allegiance to your race, your color, and put that allegiance to Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you should, and, and keep your mouth shut. Learn to keep your mouth shut when things affect you personally. So anyway, let's continue. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on the other hand, indeed a person will speak words that are pleasing to Allah in which Allah, that person will be given a condition in which Allah will raise him. But then he can say one word that can take him back down to the hellfire. That's the other hand. You can be a person that has all the good things to say about Allah, to say about the prophet, but then you transgress the limits, which is something that so many of us women do, include myself. I can get angry. I cannot control my temper to the point where I say one word. What's my word that I'm known for? B. And it's over with. Hello. You see, guys, I'm not like anyone else you know. I don't only admonish you. I will admonish myself. I'm harder on myself than I am on anybody else on this planet. That's why I have the sicknesses I have, because I'm a perfectionist. And I struggle with having to accept the fact that perfection lies only with Allah. So I destroy myself more than I do anyone else. You think I hurt you? I hurt myself more than you. I'm working on oppression, not oppressing myself too. And I know my weakness. I can get angry. I can get agitated. And that one word, please take care of this, um, Awa. That one word, that one word I say, B. You guys know the word. And all my good deeds gone down the drain. So as you can see, guys, the tongue is a two-way sword. It can cut or it can heal. Some of us got a problem with our personal feelings and we say things that create a war. Then other people such as myself, we get agitated and we can say a word that destroys even though I'm in the right. Even though I'm in the right, I can destroy every good deed I did because I said, you be. Hello? We need to work on changing the condition of ourselves. And as Muslim women, it begins with this thing here, that tongue, that tongue, that tongue. Also, we have a hadith where one of the companions said that he went to the prophet and said, oh, prophet of Allah, tell me about something that I can hold true to, something that would be a benefit to just me. The prophet said, first of all, say that you believe in Allah and remain firm on that. So the companion said, oh, prophet, tell me something that's even more serious or more better that I should fear for myself. The prophet then pointed to his tongue and said this, fear this, fear this, fear this tongue. Again, many battles, many wars were started because of that tongue. Also, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not talk much 
without remembering a law because too much talk without remembrance of a law will harden the heart. And indeed, the people who are farthest away from a law are the ones who have hardened hearts. That's why when we first made this Zoom room, another handful of sisters, they don't even come here much no more. Another hand of sisters got mad because I had to let them know this is an Islamic website. Anything that we do here has to focus and center around remembering Allah. This is not a website that we can come to and watch movies that got cursing and stuff in it. This is not a place for us women to take off no hijab. Because one sister asked you, sister later, can't we take off? No, we're not taking off no hijabs, sitting around gossiping. No, I've never seen that sister anymore. I mean, come on, people. We Anything we do, this is an Islamic website. Everything we do who, here has to center around remembering Allah. If I sit here and let you sisters turn this into a, a, a boudoir, I'm going to be held accountable to Allah for that. And it's going to lead to all type of chaos and all type of sin. Any gathering that is not spent remembering Allah is a bad gathering, guys. So I made a lot of sisters that mad then too. And those sisters were good sisters and I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them since. You know, I'm always making enemies. Let me tell you about Layla Nasheba. Layla Nasheba, I've always told y'all, is the most hated dyer in America the most hated dyer in the West, because nobody controls me, nobody censors me, except the law, okay? I'm gonna keep it real. I'm not like any woman you've ever met, and you're probably not gonna meet any other woman like me again in your life. I don't fear nothing but a law. I'm the one that has no fear of anything but a law. That's why you can't censor me. You can hurt me if you're somebody close to me, I may hesitate before I respond to you. Like it took me a couple of days to, to figure out what I'm going to do about this situation here, but I'm dealing with it now. It may take me a couple of days if you somebody close to me, but you can't censor me either, especially when I know I'm in the right. Now, if I'm in the wrong, I'll buckle over and tell you I was wrong. I was wrong for calling you the B word, but I ain't wrong in this, in, in this stuff here. We have to get it together, guys. Get it together, guys. Change the condition of ourselves. You know, I'm gonna always make people hate me. I can never make people happy. Just like those sisters ain't been back here because they wanted my Zoom room to be a place where the women can take off their hijabs and, and get laxed and watch movies. It ain't that type of room. So they left. And now I got some people mad at me because I'm teaching y'all the truth that Islam is based on having allegiance to Allah, the prophet, and, and the Muslims, not a language. Islam is not based on Arabism. I've been teaching that for over 30 years. Your language does not define you in Islam. Show me one hadith. For you sisters that got the attitude, show me one hadith or one verse of the Quran where Allah says your language is what defines you as a Muslim. You got an attitude over that? You got an attitude because I said when you speak your slang, you sound like you're spitting and you sound like a chicken. It's the truth. That's what this sounds like. You mad because I tell you that your slang English is gross? It is gross. I'm speaking the truth and I'm an equal opportunist. Please take care of that. I am an equal opportunist. I'm not just attacking Arabs. I ain't attacking nobody. I'm speaking the truth about people on earth, about mankind. And for you to take it that way, that means there's something personal with you. That's why you the only one holding that sign, you and your, your sidekick. You got one supporter, one, that's it. One out of a million. And she got problems too. Okay. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged his companions. He said, control your tongue. Remain in your home. 
weep over your sins. This is what I've been trying to emphasize to, to you guys during this, these uh, first three weeks of Ramadan. Weep over your sins. Change the condition of yourself. See what your shortcomings are. See what your weaknesses are and work to change them. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when the son of Adam awakes from his sleep, all of his body parts seek refuge from his tongue, saying, fear Allah in regards to us, because we are a part of you. If you are good, then we will be good. But if you are bad, we will be bad. So even our body, every morning that we wake up, our body, our body parts testify and say, please watch your tongue today. Sister Layla, watch what you say today. Sister Layla, watch what you do today. Because if you, your, if your tongue messes up, then we all got to be in that fire as a consequence. So, and again, guys, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us how well we protect our tongue, how well we guard our tongue determines just how strong you are as a believer. You think that you all bet in a bag of chips? You think that you such a strong throw down Muslim woman? Your tongue determines that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said from the goodness of a person's religion, it's that he will abandon talking about things that don't concern him, especially when you come into a, 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 a atmosphere such as my Zoom room and you see me giving a, a, a answering a question from somebody here about the dean. I'm the one qualified, not you. And you hear me telling a person that Islam is based on blah, 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 not blue, blue, blue. It's none of your business. You should not open your mouth anyway. This was between me and the sister. In this case, this was me and Precious. I was advising her and teaching her that you don't have to have an Arabic name to be a Muslim. I didn't make that law. I was the law made the law. And I was telling her, you don't have to take on an Arabic name to be a Muslim. And I was answering the question of Brother Robert, the new convert, that you don't have to have an Arabic name. You don't have to get rid of your name to be a Muslim. I'm so sick of this. Hold on. I'm going to have to make some old moderators here who know how to work this Zoom room. I want this set where can't nobody put a camera on. <sighs> Let me do it. <sighs> when I'm answering a question, that I'm, uh, or addressing a Muslim about an Islamic matter, it don't concern you anyway. Why did you have to open your mouth and say anything? Now, if I was saying something that contradict what a law says, that's different. But I wasn't saying anything that contradicts a law and his tenets. So again, as the prophet says, you know, keep your mouth shut if something does not concern you then shut up. If it ain't your business, if it ain't relating to you, shut up. Okay. Uh, excuse me, brother star friends. You are from a different country. I am speaking in a very decent way. The way that I am speaking, this is the way we speak in America. I am an American. If you don't like my American accent, then you can go listen to your Pakistani accent. The way I speak is decent. And this is another example, guys. Someone who got to put their foot in their mouth. The way I am speaking is the way you should be speaking. 
If you claim that you want to give dawa to non-Pakistani uh, speaking people, is there anybody here listening to me that thinks my English is indecent? Is there anyone listening here who thinks that my American English is indecent? And the people listening to me are mostly Americans, Brother Sarfraz. I am speaking very decently. It's not my fault that it ain't your language. And again, the goodness of a Muslim's religion is he abandons what does not concern him and he thinks before he speaks because you've just illustrated how a person puts their foot in their mouth, calling themselves giving advice. This is the same way this fitna happened on my website two days ago. Somebody calling themselves giving advice and didn't know, and first of all, what you're saying is not correct. There's no tenet of Islam violated. I am an American, and this is the way Americans speak. I can't change the way I speak. Allah made me speak this way. If you got a problem with it, Brother Safraz, you got two options. You can, number one, get the heck out of here, or number two, Go listen to the people speak Islam in your native tongue because I'm communicating with people in my native tongue. And if you think American English is indecent, that's your problem. That's another example. That's how the fitness started on my Zoom room the other day. So anyway, guys, you know, uh, let me get back to the hadiths. Some of the companions, one of them asked the prophet, they said, oh, prophet of Allah, how many defects were you able to find in the son of Adam? In other words, how many deficiencies do we have about ourselves as Muslims? The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, our deficiencies are too many to count. However, of all the defects that we have, the worst is what Brother Sarfraz showed us, our tongue. Not guarding our tongue. Being so quick to open our mouths, to say something, to be seen, to be recognized. And we end up looking foolish, looking stupid, holding up a sign by ourselves like he looks right now. Also, one of the early scholars of Islam said, whoever limits his speech to be in accordance with his actions, this is a person that will minimize his speech on that which doesn't concern him. And also, again, Imam Ashafi said, do not speak about things that don't concern you because every time you speak a word, it takes control of you and you do not have control of it. And Ibn Masood, he said, of all the things that deserves to be imprisoned, none deserves to be imprisoned more than the tongue as brother Sarfraz just illustrated. So again, guys, as we go through this third week of fasting, we have to work on ourselves. We have to work on changing the condition of ourselves. We have to work on changing how we look at life, how we look at others, and instead look at ourselves. Work on you. Guard your tongue. Before you speak out about something, make sure you're right. Make sure an action that against the law has been committed. A poet once said, guard your tongue, O mankind, and do not let it bite you, because indeed the tongue is a snake. 
How many people are in the graves because of their tongues? Whoever fears meeting a law is truly the brave one who safeguards his or her tongue. So let's work on that this Ramadan, guys. Especially those of us who are women. Because again, we women, this is one of the number one reasons why there will be more of us than, in hell than men. Men can guard their tongues a little better. But we women have a real bad problem with this. We take it raw. We'll, we start wars. We destroy websites. We take down good people because of our tongues and our emotions, that PMS that we suffer from. Okay, so we'll stop right here for today. If you guys have any questions or comments, Inshallah, you can type them on the screen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta.